your grace and your mercy, your unconditional yes, love Jesus. that we are here today, Father. Father, as we go forward, Father, with this celebration, Father, I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit just take complete control over our mind, body, heart, and soul, Father. And I pray, Father, today we forget about our sorrow, our pain, Father, and we just lift up our voice, Father, and give you praise and glory and honor, Father, for you alone are worthy, worthy of it all. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin this morning with a song that's going to be led by Brother Dennis, but uh, the remnant of our uh, praise and worship group and team are going to sing with him. Our music directors are in Florida welcoming a new member of their family. They have a daughter who has adopted I think it's a little girl or a little boy. A boy and a girl. Double. And a brother and sister. They're, she's actually going to legally adopt them. And they went down there for that ceremony and for the blessing of that. As they now legally have two more grandchildren. And so that's where our music director and music directors are at the moment. We wish them travel mercies uh, in return. Um, but um, Brother Dennis is going to, he, he's used to this. He's, he's one of our music and sound men here. And so he's going to lead us a song. I think um, Brother Lloyd is going to accompany him. Uh, a couple of us on the praise and work worship team is going to do our part to sing with this. And then after that, we're going to get out of the way so Brother Lloyd can have his way in the Lord. And so that's what we're going to do. A very, very appropriate song, traditional song. This is something that Brother Dennis wanted to sing. If there's anything he'd like to say about it, he, he's welcome to do so. Now really, the words say everything for themselves. God sent His Son Yeah. Hey. 
thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you. It's because you live, we can face it all. And it's because he lives, we can conquer it. And that's what we're doing right now in this world, in this life we're living. We are conquering. It may seem like we're getting slapped and slapped around and pushed down. But you know what? We are conquering. Because we're not going to let the enemy have his hold. Jesus said the ruler of the world is coming and he has no hold on me. And he's given us the power to have the same fortitude. Our brother Lord. It's no longer dead. No 
He's more powerful now than he's ever been. But we're going to see the greatest manifestation of that power when he cracks that sky. And then the Bible says, every eye will then see him. The same way he ascended in, this, in, in being visible, he will return and reappear visible. And then the world will know. In fact, the world will be in so much all over it, it said every knee will bow and confess that he is Lord. But you know what? If you didn't confess the Lord before that point, it might be too late for you. That's why we believe. We believe now. Because our Savior is so alive right now in our hearts. And we're in His presence. We know it. That's why you're here today. It's our prayer that we'll keep that belief. And we'll be living in this resurrected life. We're going to talk about that later. Let's continue to praise and worship Him. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh be fair There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus is all And the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No more.
because all things are possible for you. And that's what I'm praying over every soul in here. I'm praying for a miracle. Wipe the slate clean, Father. Move in the hearts of these souls here. To not just come here to receive a blessing. A physical blessing. But to be changed. And to be regenerated. And to be formed into a new creature. That has a will and purpose. And be the disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what our lives are for. That's our purpose. The selfish things of this world will fall. The selfish things of this world will pass away. But your word says he that does your will remain forever. And I am praying that eternity upon every soul in here. Bless their hearts. Bless their souls. Draw them closer to you. Allow them to see your face. I pray for this country as it falls apart. I pray, Father, that you will put the power and the boldness in us not to allow the fear of what man is trying to do to overcome what our mission is. We will praise you till our dying breath. We will do what you commissioned us to do until they put us in a position we can't do it anymore. And even if they take our life, Father, in our death, we will praise you. Because you are our God. And if our Lord can do it for us, then we can do it for Him. We love you. We thank you. We honor you. We pray for your, for your presence to overwhelm us this day. May we rejoice because our Savior lives and He's living right here inside of us. He is here in our presence today. And we honor Him. For He did the greatest act of love that could ever be done. And He showed us how to love. Give us that strength, Father, to imitate that example. Bless all the ones here today. We pray for travel mercies over our, 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 our church members now that are in Florida on their way home. We pray for travel mercies upon Brother Lloyd and his family as they go back to Brevard this afternoon. We pray for whatever souls in here who has any kind of disturbance. Or they're not walking in that peace that Christ promised. May they hear something or be touched by something today that will change how they feel. May they walk out those doors with confidence that you love them. That they're going to see your face. We love you, Father. We thank you, Father. We give you all glory, all honor, all praise on this Resurrection Sunday morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 We'll call for our announcement.
servant, right? We all have sinned. We all have fallen short. And he still loves us. He died for us when we were sinners. We are still living in our sin, right? The God that we serve, I just want to just thank the Lord that 14 years ago, I found him when I was dying physically. He came and he saved me. And I don't want anybody else but him. Praise God. I just want to thank each and every one that came this morning and prepared the meal. And we had sunrise service. Brother Dennis, Brother Caesar, Brother Cowboy, and our sister uh, Mariah. Uh, they came. They prepared the beautiful breakfast for everybody. And it was such a blessing, right? And uh, please, nobody needs to go hungry today. We got plenty of food. The God, right, he multiplies. He's still multiplying. Brother John just brought us more food. <laughs> the God that we serve, right? And we left nothing. But we have having a fried fish and baked potatoes today for sure. <laughs> All right. And we got plenty so you can take home to share with your own ones too. Okay. Um, on Wednesdays, we have Bible study at our home. It's at uh, 6.30. If uh, anybody who wants to go, um, just let us know. We'll pick you up. We, uh, we can pick you up either at Bird Life or uh, wherever it works for you. We'll pick you up. And... Uh, so the Bible study is at 6.30, and uh, we have a choir practice here at 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Praise God, today we had uh, our brother and sister in Christ that came and did the praise and worship. We appreciate them being here, and uh, with their Ooh. lovely family here. <laughs> you know, they, they drive four and a half hours to just come and fellowship with us. That's a blessing, right? <laughs> Um, if anybody who needs to please come and see me here on Thursdays. Uh, we have uh, food that we can give you to cook. So uh, just come and uh, see me here on Thursdays from 12 to 4. And uh, also on Thursdays, we are here with spirit, uh, spiritual food too. Auntie Kathleen is here. And uh, if you need prayer, if you need encouragement, like I said, if you're going through something, if you want to just talk to somebody, we're here to help you. Thursday from 12 to 4, please come and see us, okay? And uh, if you need uh, counseling or financial budgeting advice, see Pastor Kathleen right there in pink? Uh-huh. And uh, just continue to uh, pray for uh, this country, the city, we keep on praying for the Cherry Lane, for our brothers and sisters that is out right now, right there. We continue to pray for them. Because, you know, somebody prayed for us. And prayed us through. Amen. That's why we are here, right? Amen. So we're going to continue to pray for our brothers and sisters. And we're going to love him because he loved us first, right? Yeah. Right. The room where they gathered was called the Upper. 
is where Christ and his disciples shared his last supper. The price he paid for sin, the suffering for you and me, called for him to die, be hanged on a tree. He was spit upon, humiliated, beaten, and scourged. He went humbly and peacefully without saying a word. The message he delivered to us by dying on that cross. He's paid for our sins, and we're no longer lost. Now we have a way to the Heavenly Father above by trusting in Christ and showing brotherly love. Thank you, Theodore. Okay, we're going to have communion now, and I'm going to read to you from Matt Mark. I, I hope you notice that sometimes these four first Gospels had very similar sayings in each of them. And that's because they all lived through it, right? And they're writing what they actually experienced. This is the Lord's Supper, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. Assuredly, I say to you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And he drinks it with us. I always like that last sentence. <laughs> because he's going to be drinking it again for the first time since then with us when we go to meet him in, in, the, in the heavens. Okay. We need some help over here. Whoever wants to volunteer. <laughs> Thank you, Paya. Father, I just want to pray over this bread and bless it to the happy bless it to the nourishment of our bodies, our souls, and our minds, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Glory to your blood for our
bread of life. Take and live forever. Oh, wait. 
true, yeah. How true, how true. That's why today's so special. The day that Jesus raised. So special for all of us. In fact, this is the greater than Christmas. We couldn't have this day if it weren't for Christmas. However, this is this was the explanation point at the end of the chapter today. Because everything is said for you because of what happened today. Glory be to God. If you have your bulletin, if you look on the inside of it, there's a there's a uh, a sheet that's got a whole lot of scriptures on it. I put all that there for you. I encourage you, it's yours. You can have it. You can take it with you so you have it as a quick reference. But these are the, uh, some of the scriptures will be read. Some of them will be cited here today in this message. And this is everything put together for you in scripture form. Our passage of scripture for today is taken from the book of Matthew chapter 22. We're going to read verses 23 to 33. It's there on your... In your bulletin, in that on that page, so we're going to read that and base our message upon this. Matthew chapter twenty-two, verse twenty-three to thirty-three. The same day, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him and asked him, saying, "Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall first who first died after he married, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother." Likewise, the second also, and the third, even in the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. The Father, I lift up this word. The words that came forth out of the Son of God Pray, Father, that there's something here today we're going to get. Might be something we've never seen before. It may, it may be something we've seen. It may be something that we've tried to ignore. But I pray, Father, that you're going to speak loud and clear through your word today. And I pray that there will be a deliverance in this word. A deliverance in our mind and heart and our attitude. And a deliverance, Father and the way we see things. Please, Father, anoint my mouth and anoint the ears of those who will hear this. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. His name was Roger Williams. Oh, by the way, the, the title of this message is on the back of your bulletin. And the title is Life Coming Forth Out of the Dead. As I said, his name was Roger Williams. And he was a famous 17th century religious leader. He died in the year 1683. He was buried in a poorly marked grave in the backyard of his home. Nearly 200 years later, in the year 1860, five years before Lincoln was assassinated, one of his descendants ordered his body exhumed and moved to a more suitable location, but when they excavated the grave, they didn't find a body. All they found were a few badly rusted coffin nails and a few scraps of rotten wood. But they did find something else in the grave that amazed them. It seems an apple tree had grown up next to the burial site and one of the roots had had grown into the spot where Roger William had been laid to rest, taking the shape of William's body from his head to his heels. As it grew, the root apparently had encountered William's skull, 
and followed the path of least resistance, etching down the side of his head, backbone, hips, and legs, molding itself closely to the contours of his body. The corpse itself was gone, absorbed into the tree through its roots. The tree had eaten rotten leaves. And over the years, it produced numerous apples that had been eaten by people in the community. Now, the Bible tells me that when Jesus returns, we will all rise from the dead and have a new body. But how is God going to put Roger Williams' body back together again? It's a mystery to me, but it's not a mystery to God. Back in 1994, Brian Kelly, a firework handler, went out with a bang. <laughs> no pun intended, I suppose. During his grand finale at a convention of fireworks. And here, they, all these technicians got together for a convention. It was near Pittsburgh, Burr, Pennsylvania. And it's, as he was dying, he told his family members he wanted his ashes loaded into a firework shell and exploded, scattering his remains across the sky. Now, how is God going to piece that man back together again? I don't know. It's a mystery to me, but it's not a mystery. God. Years ago, a painter died and was cremated. His friends mixed his remains with white paint, and the paint was used to paint the white lines along US 50, somewhere between Cincinnati and St. Louis. It's a, how's God ever going to get the man out of the paint? It's a mystery to me, but it's not a mystery to God. When the trumpet sounds and Jesus descends, if need be, he'll come down with a celestial scraper and scrape that man right off the pavement. And if he's a Christian, he'll zoom him up to be Jesus in the air. But if he's not, then he'll go someplace else. The idea that our bodies will be resurrected from the dead even hundreds of years after we have died, it's difficult for people to accept. Several years ago, during the Easter, Easter season, Newsweek magazine decided to run a couple of articles on the resurrection of the dead. And their articles seem to be in an agreement that Christians down through the ages have had difficulties accepting the bodily resurrection of the dead. One of the articles was by senior religious editor of Newsweek magazine, Lisa Miller. And she published this in April 5th, 20, uh, I guess you could say 2010. Commenting on the idea of the physical resurrection, Ms. Miller called the idea a conundrum for believers. Conundrum was a $20 word used to express her sentiments that she can't really believe in. Several times in her article, she said that the idea of a physical resurrection was unbelievable. It strained the credibility of even the most devout believers, she said. It, quote, presented credibility problems, unquote. And she concluded, for my part, I don't buy it. Now this was from an article by Newsweek senior editor of the religious section of the magazine. And she blatantly rejected the belief that there would be a bodily resurrection. Now, to be fair, she's not the first to have problems with the idea. The Sadducees of Jesus' day rejected that anybody's body uh, couldn't rise from the dead. When Jesus spoke to his disciples and told them that he would die, be buried, and rise again, Peter couldn't believe it, Matthew 16, 22. And when the other disciples heard the news, Matthew 17, 23, that he had died, they were filled with grief. After Jesus rose from the dead, when Peter and John raced to the tomb and found it empty, John chapter 20 verse 9 tells us, For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And several years later, when Paul wrote his first letter to the congregation in Corinth, he had to deal with individuals who were bringing the very same heresy into the church. 
So when the senior religious editor of Newsweek dismissed the concept that there's going to be a bodily resurrection of the dead, she wasn't saying something unusual. She was just simply stating something that was wrong. As I read her article, I found it odd that she didn't appear to be attacking the resurrection of Jesus as much as she was questioning the possibilities of believers like you and I being able to rise from the dead. But the Bible counters that by asking. Notice what Paul said. It's on your page here. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 12. Now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say there is no resurrection of the dead? The resurrection of the body is one of the major teachings of Jesus' ministry. Repeatedly, he told his disciples that he himself would rise from the dead on the third day. In Matthew 16, 21, we're told that from the time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised, when? The third day. In Matthew 17 and 22. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day, he will be raised up. The English Standard Version says he will be raised to life. And Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 to 19, we find Jesus repeating for at least the third time. Verse 17, now Jesus going to Jerusalem took the twelve aside on the road said to them, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. And the Bible assures us that since Jesus rose from the dead, guess what? We're going to be rose as well. Jesus rose from the dead to prove that it can be done. Now since that is true, why would people like the religious editor of the Newsweek magazine struggle with such a clear biblical teaching? Well first, they reject the idea of a bodily resurrection because they can't understand it. Ms. Miller said it was unbelievable. It presented credibility problems and that she didn't buy it. For people like her, the bodily resurrection doesn't make any sense. People like her have never seen it, seen it before. Therefore, it can't happen. Since I can't see it, it can't happen. Well, you know, that's kind of the same is true of those who've never spoken tongues. Those who have never been able to have that gift will sometimes doubt that someone has that gift. If you're not able to experience or see it yourself, you can't see it. You don't understand it. Paul tells us that we actually have seen this kind of thing many times over. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35 to 36. Notice what Paul wrote. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. How many of you ever worked in a garden? Ever planted a seed in the ground? What Paul's saying here is that every time you planted a seed in a garden, what happens to the seed? It grows. But before it grows, what happens? The seed dies. It, but it doesn't stay there. It was buried. It died. But because of the power that God placed in that seed, what happens to that seed? It comes to life. It rose from the ground. And what happens? It bears fruit. In the same way, when we die, our bodies or our ashes will be buried. Now, if we were with God, our soul goes to heaven. But what happens to our body? It stays here. And when Jesus comes again, the Bible says all the dead shall rise. Whether they want to rise or not, they're going to rise. 
I'm told that there's a cemetery in Hanover, Germany that a very, has a very unusual grave. Listen to this. On top of the grave are huge slabs of granite marble cemented together and they're fastened with heavy steel clasps. It belongs to a woman who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Yet, strangely, she directed in her will that her grave be made so secure that if there were a resurrection, it could not reach her. <laughs> On the marker are inscribed these words. This burial place must never be opened. Guess what? It didn't work. And the dirt beneath those slabs of marble and granite was a little tiny seed. And in time, even though it was covered with those huge blocks of stone, it began to grow. And it slowly pushed its way through the dirt and out of the slabs. And as it forced its way up, and the marble and granite were gradually shifted so that the steel flaps that held them were wrenched from their sockets, it opened the grave. <laughs> a tiny seed had become a tree that had pushed aside the stones. And the grave was open. When Jesus comes back again, all the dead shall rise, whether they want to or not. Some folks have a hard time understanding they can't understand. They might have thought it was unbelievable and not credible. But it's going to happen. Now there's two other reasons why people might reject the resurrection of the dead. In Matthew chapter 22, we're told about the time the Sadducees approached Jesus. These were men who refused to believe in the resurrection. And they intended to trap him with a puzzle. They just knew he couldn't answer. Now back in the days of Jesus, the law of Moses decreed that if a woman married a man and he died without having any children by her, that man's brother, and I think that the law really stipulated that if he wasn't married, was obligated to marry his brother's wife and make sure his dead brother's part of the family inheritance was protected. The man would have children with the brother's wife after the brother had died so that that inheritance of the brother's part would still continue. That's what the law stated. So the Sadducees wove a story. This didn't really happen. They were just saying, what if? They, they wove a story of a woman who'd been married. Her husband had died, and she married the brother. The brother died, and she did marry another brother. And it kept on happening until she had married seven brothers. And finally, the seventh one died. It was seen, I'm only making a joke here, that this woman must have been a very difficult woman to live with. Yeah, right. But it, it seems here that the, the, the Sadducees then were going to be smug about this. And they, they asked, well, so, so, Rabbi, in the resurrection, now that this woman has seven dead husbands, which one will her husband be? Now, when Jesus heard this question, he only shook his head and he explained that they didn't know what they were talking about. We read it in Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But before he explained that to them, he touched upon the two major reasons why they refused to accept the idea. In verse 29 he said, number one, you're mistaken. Number two, you don't know the scripture. And the power of God. There were two reasons why these religious Sadducees rejected the resurrection of the dead. They didn't know the scriptures. And when confronting the, 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 the Sadducees, Jesus quoted from Exodus chapter 3 verse 6. And he said, But even Moses showed that in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. The God of Jacob, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. That is Luke chapter 20, verse 37 to 38. Now what 
Jesus is essentially asking here, he said, why would Yahweh be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if they were dead and never coming back? Why would he even say that? The Old Testament scripture is just loaded with promises that there will be a bodily resurrection. Psalm 16 and 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Job 19, 25 and 27. Job said, For I know that my Redeemer lives. Oh, they have a song about that. I know my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know. That in my flesh I shall see God. In my flesh. He didn't say in my soul. In my flesh I shall see God. Whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. And then Isaiah prophesied. Verse 20, chapter 26 and 19. Your dead shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. Awake and see you who dwell in dust. For your dust is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And Hosea 13 and 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. The grave, we're talking about the grave, the physical place where your body is supposed to be. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh, death, I will be your place. Oh, grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. The problem for those Sadducees was they didn't have biblical proof of God's promises. Or I should say the problem wasn't that they didn't have biblical proof. The proof was there. We just read it. But you know what was the problem? That the, 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 the Sadducees had all these scrolls and had all these scriptures. But when they read them, they didn't so what did they do? What do you do when you read something in the Bible you don't like? You close it. They rolled up their scroll. They skipped it. They said, well, that don't mean that don't apply to me. That was the problem they had. God's Word didn't say what they thought it should say, so they chose to ignore the Scripture that they didn't agree with. And that's why they were sad, you see. That's what I always said about the Sadducees. They were called Sadducees. They were sad, you see, because they couldn't see the resurrection. The second reason the Sadducees rejected the resurrection of the dead was because they didn't know the power of God. Their God wasn't big enough to raise people from the dead. Their God didn't have the power. Their God wasn't the master of the universe. He was the slave of their puny imaginations. He was a small, pathetic deity who just sat on the shelf and was brought down when they wanted to polish him and bow before his wretched image. Then they put him back on the shelf and go after living their lives the way they chose to. <coughs> But the result of their faith in this pathetic God was a hopeless future. As Sigmund Freud observed, quote, and finally there is the painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has yet been found. No probably will ever be, unquote. I think Sigmund stole that from the Apostle Paul. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. For people who refuse to believe God's promise of the bodily res resurrection, death is the ultimate enemy. One man put it this way, fear of death makes us act foolishly, committing ourselves to self-destructive habits, 
enslaving ourselves because we see that our bodies are deteriorating. We anesthetize ourselves with drugs and alcohol. We try to act younger than we are and make fools of ourselves, sometimes even destroying our families in the process of trying to reverse the irreversible process of aging. Because we are perishable, we try all kinds of potions and products. We even become involved in sexual misconduct to try to escape the inevitable. Unquote. Yes. For these folks, Death is an inescapable hole in the ground. All because their God has no power. Their God can't raise the dead because their God, guess what, isn't real. But brothers and sisters, our God is real. Our God has the power to do whatever He wants to do. And our God proved His power by raising Jesus from the dead. And in the last day, you know what he's going to do? He's going to raise you and me too. Mm -hmm. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 52, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. In other words, we, what he's saying is we're not going to stay in our graves. He said, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised in incorruptible and we shall be changed. How many, how many of you know who Dwight Moody was? Dwight L. Moody. He once declared this quote. Someday you will read in the papers that Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it? At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the spirit in 1855. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the spirit shall live forever. Unquote. This is the promise of the resurrection. It's a promise that God has given us. And God included that promise into the very act of our salvation. Did you know that? Did you realize that? When someone wants to become a Christian, what is the most public sign that they have done that? Baptism. That's the most public sign of it. We put them down into the water, into a grave. But do we leave them there? We might if we don't like them. <laughs> of course not. We bring them back up as in a resurrection from the dead. Paul explained that in Romans chapter 6. In verse 4, I'll read it. Therefore, when we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Because we join Jesus in his death and burial, we are also raised up to a new life. And in baptism, God has reinforced his promise that in the last day, we will be raised from the dead. And because of that promise, we don't fear death like the rest of the world does. We have a sister right now who it sounds like she's in the process of being healed. But when she thought death was imminent and the doctors told her that she was fourth stage and that she, there wasn't really a hope, she didn't get scared and upset and angry. Her attitude was, I'm going to see Jesus. How can I be scared? How can I be upset? I'm going to leave this world and go be with my Lord. She's in this room right now. But in the process of that faith, she told me yesterday, what was it, yesterday or Friday, she said, the doctor told me I'm in stage two. She went from stage four to stage two. Give it another few weeks, there might not be any. Again, the power of God. We have a God who has more power. He's the source of all power. 
God. And we cannot underestimate what He can or will do. Now there was another example of a sister that I knew of who had a sister who died when she was a young girl. Her death devastated her father. Every year on her birthday, the father would go out to the graveside and he would weep just about all day. Every year on her birthday. I, I get emotional because I, I, when I, when I, you know, think about stuff, I, I relate it to myself. I have two daughters, and if I ever had to bury one of them, I don't know how I would react either. But this man, every year on her birthday, would go and cry and weep over his daughter's grave. <laughs> But one man, one day, that man met a Christian who introduced him to Jesus. And from that moment on, he still went to her graveside every birthday and put flowers on it. But he no longer went. You know why? Because he knew that. He knew she wasn't going to stay there. That's what knowing God, knowing Christ does. It changes our whole perspective of life. What we encounter. What we go through. How we view things. Knowing Jesus, knowing that Jesus came into you and he changed you. What was corruptible in you, the sin that was in you, faded. You were changed. We call that being born again. There's a reason why we call it born again. You know why you're born again? First time you came out of your mother a sinner. A complete sinner. With all the human flesh weaknesses. And you know what? You proved it. Because when you was a little baby, you when you were selfish, you didn't care if mom and daddy hadn't had any sleep. When you wanted to eat and you wanted to be changed, what did you do? You woke them up. You didn't care about mom and daddy. And, and, oh, I don't think mommy got enough bread, so I'll wait another three hours before I cry. <laughs> right? We come out selfish. We come out greedy. We come out. That's how we come out. Now, yeah, we look at a little child and say, oh, they're so innocent. They're so pretty. There's nothing wrong with them. But you'd get a call if he made me and then come back and tell me. You feel that way. Both of ours were call again. I love them to death. <laughs> but we were born into sin. We came into the world sinners. And then as we get older, we make decisions sometimes don't reflect God at all. God's nowhere in our life. And we go out and do things we shouldn't do. We steal from people. We hurt people. We do terrible things. Sometimes we have to even go to jail for all that. We really hurt people. Some of us may have even killed somebody before. Steal from people. Hurt ourselves, hurt our families. But then you come to church one day and you're around some Christians, and all of a sudden something happened. Boom! The Holy Spirit gets a hold of you. Mm -hmm. And now the very things that you used to scheme over. And the very things that you wanted to go out here and do, I can't even, 
that makes me sick, the, the thought of it makes me sick now. You used to use every four-letter word, and, and you, couldn't, you couldn't say one sentence without using at least three or four four-letter words. Now, you say just a simple one, and you're like, oh, I feel bad. I don't want to talk like that anymore. Why do you think that is? It's Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. That's what it is. He's conforming you into a new creature. We call it being born again. And you know what else he said in John chapter 3? If you're not born again, guess what? You don't see the kingdom of God. So it's about change. Jesus is the greatest surgeon because every time he brings one to him, we get a heart transplant. Complete heart transplant. Our will, our motivation, our desire. Everything that we used to want to do, now we don't want to do it. And the things we would have called dead doing, that's all we want to do now. I'm not going to go sit in church for three hours. I'm not going to go do that. I'm not going to go put money in that place right now. I got, I got to get in. I'm not going to go out there. They're going to be cooking it. I'm not going to go do that. I've got something more important to do. That's how we used to think. But when Jesus has gotten on the inside and started working in this, we become something different. And you know what that's called? It's called being resurrected. You got resurrected spiritually. Okay? That born again thing is being resurrected spiritually. You were dead in your trespasses, in your sin, and now you're alive. You've come up out of the grave. You're alive. But it's not just there. The Bible gives us so many physical descriptions of on the last day. We're going to raise up. Now, you might sit here and say, Pastor, that don't make any sense. Because when I die, I go to be with the Lord then. My body's down there and I'm up there. What, am I coming back to earth? Before that, well, I honestly can't tell you how that's going to work, but I, I can say this. The Bible does say that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, if you're in the Lord. Amen. So there's going to be some kind of reconnection to our souls in heaven and our DNA here somewhere here on the earth. You say, well, how can God do it? Well, let me ask you something. How did God take the dust of the ground and the, and the air that was in the atmosphere and make out. If God can do that, He can take all the fish waste in the bottom of the ocean and pull your DNA out of it. Or as we talked about earlier, He can take you out of the tank. He can take Jenny Hoffa out of the concrete. He can do anything He can't wants to do. And has a will to do. I'm not going to get into all the scientific speculations of well, what, how could this happen, how could that happen. I don't have to. I'm talking about God. God has no restrictions in what He can do. If He put it all together to begin with, then He can put it all back together again after we tore it up. And that's all we need to realize. We are going to be in a glorified body with Him. He, Jesus told his disciples, you will have a body like mine, and we will sit down and sup. Now what kind of body did Jesus have when he said it? It was a glorified body. It wasn't a spirit body. It was a glorified physical body. And that's what's going to happen. Read Thessalonians. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And then it says, Then those that remain shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's two different sets of people. So the dead in Christ who rise first are who? That's your, 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 your husband, your wife, your mama, your daddy. The people you love that you know are now with the Lord, they're going to rise first. How we're going to see it, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see how that works. But they will rise first. 
Once the dead in Christ have risen, what will happen? Church, get ready. The rapture. Then those that remain shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So before we're raptured, our loved ones are going to reconnect to a body somehow, some way, and they're going to rise. I can only imagine what it's going to be like before the rapture if I actually get to physically see my grandfather. Think about that. That's how you know you're getting ready to go up. If you've seen one of your dead relatives, if you're able to see that visibly, you're going to know, okay, get ready. We're getting ready to launch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, how many? I don't know how it's going to work. All I know is what's in the Word. And you got to take the Word for what it says. Yes, there is ways you have to interpret it. But when it's talking about physical things, there normally is a physical interpretation. Most of the time. But that's what this is all about. You're being resurrected right now in the spirit. <coughs> and if you perish before the rapture takes place, then there's going to be a resurrection of your body. Physical. That means in heaven... When you go up to grandma and you go up to your children, you're not going to be hugging in the spirit. You're going to feel flesh. Say, so, well, the, the says flesh and, it said, it said flesh and, and, and uh, blood cannot inherit the kingdom. It didn't say. It, that's right. It said flesh and blood. It didn't say flesh and bones couldn't inherit it. To be technical, but there again, you got to understand what was the kingdom. What was the kingdom? What was the, What was it talking about when it said the kingdom? Was it talking about heaven? Or was it talking about the church? Oh, uh, uh, there might be a deeper interpretation of that scripture if you think about it. Or, or, I'm not going to keep on elaborating. I'm just making the point that this is what Easter is all really all about. It's your soul. Being saved from sin and being raised into a holy Christian life first. And now you are in line to receive a bodily resurrection. And if you're alive when that when that trump, trumpet takes place, that trumpet blast, if you're alive, then you're not going to have to worry about being raised. In the sense of being raised back from the, a body, your body will be transformed into something new, and then go, up, and then you will go up to the Lord. That's what this is about. But God put it all back together. He has such a beautiful way of putting everything back together the way it was supposed to have been before the devil messed it up. So that's our Easter message this year. What we're going to do, uh, we've got a whole lot of food. I hope you all came with some empty stomachs. Plenty of food. You'll have plenty to take with you, too. Uh, there's all kinds of food back there. We have fried fish. Uh, I think there's some ham back there. There's, there's all kinds of goodies back there. So what we're going to do, we're going to say a, a, a prayer, uh, give a benediction to conclude our service. But as always, we have an open altar. We have an open altar right now. So we're going to pray corporately, but if anybody needs personal prayer, if you're questioning whether or not you're walking in a regenerated life. Maybe you say, I believe, Pastor, that I'm still walking in sin. Can you help me? Well, I can't help you, but I know somebody in here. And we can, we can go to him in prayer. If you've got something personal you need to, to, to pray about, 
we can do that for you. If there's anybody here who would like to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that, that, that opportunity is always available. You can do that anytime, anywhere. Right here. You can come forward. If anybody needs any other type of healing, needs the power of God in your life right now, you got a court date. You got a, a problem in your family. You got a problem in a relationship. You got all kinds of other issues. Maybe somebody's fighting depression right now. Maybe somebody's just tired. And you need the power of God over your life. Come forward for prayer after we finish this corporate prayer. The altar is open. Our Father. We're indeed grateful for this service. We look at these three candles right here. Jesus said he's the light of the world. Well, Jesus is part of you. Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And that, that, that light shines, Father, in a dark world. We're asking, Father, that we are connected to this as well. And that we are letting our light shine. And letting others know that we are on your side. I pray for every soul here today. The ones who may feel hurt, rejected. The ones who's feeling oppressed in some way. Pray for the ones who might be afraid of a, of a medical condition. Or something that they're going through. I pray for those who are chained right now to an addiction. Something has controlled their entire life. And they're just not free. I'm praying, Father, that your power will move in them today to break that chain. Father, I pray that you bless this fellowship. I thank you, Father, for all the food, the abundance of food we have here today. It was a gift from you. You put it on the hearts of the Moncure Lions Club to provide the fish. And we thank them for that. But we thank you, Father, for putting it on their hearts. For the uh, other church that came and brought food that they had, we thank you for the willing participants of this ministry, Father, who made preparation and brought it. We thank you. You're indeed a wonderful God, and we thank you for your provision. You are our mighty God. We love you. Again, we thank you, Father, for our music today. Someone came very far, traveled, took their time, their energy, their gas, brought their family. And we thank you for their sacrifice. And we pray, Father, a blessing upon them. A blessing, a full blessing, Father. Bless what they do, their ministry, what, where they go. Bless their path. Bless their future. We thank you, Father, for all that you are giving and all that you're providing. And we just, we just know, Father, that you're, you're a God who has fulfilled every promise. And we ask, Father, that you put it in us to do the same. We love you, we honor you, we praise you. May the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be acceptable to you, our God. May we rejoice in what you have done. May we rejoice in our risen Savior. And may we rejoice, Father, that we are your children. In Jesus' mighty name we praise. Amen. Amen.
bouncing and going. It might taste good going down, but it don't feel good coming up. <laughs> Oh, you know, 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 you know,